I'm Brian Boyle, and I want to welcome you on behalf of the University of Washington and the College of Forest Resources at the University of Washington to this Denman Forestry Issues Series program today. I want to acknowledge two people, Ellen Matheny, who is with the Olympic Natural Resources Center of the University of Washington, and Bob Edmonds, who will be one of the speakers, who is Associate Dean and Professor at the College of Forest Resources, who have organized this series. I also want to acknowledge and, rec and recognize Mary Ellen Denman and her late husband, Dick Denman, whose very generous philanthropy provided the, uh, this Denman Forestry Research Series. We're here to talk about the future of forestry in the Pacific Northwest, the challenges and opportunities and the pitfalls, and more important, the remedies. When we look at the future of forestry and the future of forests, we need to ask ourselves, what is forestry without the forest? And the forest has many challenges. Land use changes are caused by rapid population growth and climate alterations. Insects, pathogens, and fire are causing tremendous problems with forest health. Wildlife, fish, and water are major concerns, ecological concerns, because they are so dependent on the health of the forest. Well, what we're going to talk about here is the responses to those things. Ecosystem services, for example, which may be a new word for many people, a new set of words for many people. Environmental advances in the way forests are managed. Wood innovations sequestration of carbon to offset carbon that comes from various human uh, uh, effluents, biofuels and bioenergy from the forest, and precision tools for more careful management of the forest and for better knowledge of the forest, and regulatory innovations, particularly with certification of forest. But I want to talk with you a little bit about, just briefly, about the forest investor and the forest investment organization of the future. In some ways, they'll look s similar to what they have been in the past. They'll depend on investment equity and debt. They will still sell timber and they'll still sell other products. And they'll still lease land and they'll still sell land. But in the future, they'll get income from renewable resources, from credits uh, for carbon, for land conservation, for rights to use the land and manage the land, for mitigations, from easements for various different uses, and from ecosystem payments and credits, not only from carbon, but also for water and for biodiversity, potentially. And so the forest investment values of the future might look something like this, in that where 20 years, in, in 20 years, it'll still, timber will still be a major component of the investment value of a forest, but why could not water and biodiversity and carbon credits and renewable energy be part of the portfolio for the forest organization of the future? And so with that introduction, I'm going to move on and I'm going to introduce the first speaker, and that person is Bruce Baer, who appropriately enough is going to talk about the future of forestry in the Pacific Northwest. Bruce Baer is, the prof is Professor of Forest Management and Quantitative Science and Dean of the College of Forest Resources. He reserved, received his BS from Purdue University, his MS from the University of Minnesota, and his PhD in Forest Management and Operations Research from Purdue, and has been at the University of Washington since 1969. His research has covered the economics of forestry and natural resources management, optimization of land allocation decisions, and the role of forest certification in sustainable forest management. In addition to his other duties, Bruce serves on Washington State's Board of Natural Resources. So with that, I want to introduce Dean Bruce Baer. Thank you very much, Brian, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here talking on this topic of the future of forestry. And my hope in the next few minutes is to try to set the stage for the other speakers that follow today. I want to talk about four topics today. First, a very brief discussion of our transition uh, from one paradigm to another 
that affects the management of our natural resources and our forest resources here in the Pacific Northwest and indeed throughout the world. Second, I want to briefly touch on some of the forces that are impacting these changes as well as future changes that we might expect. Thirdly, a very brief overview of Washington's forests, so I again set the stage for some of the, top, uh, the topics that other speakers will address. And then lastly, I want to go through a list of what I think are some of the major issues and opportunities that, that await us. I think everyone knows the history of, of the United States and the western expansion that took place and the vast logging that occurred in the south and northeast came into the Ohio Valley. A lot of deforestation took place, moved into the lake states, and then out into the northern southern Rockies into the Pacific Northwest. Uh, following that, in, in the, and this all occurred in the, basically in the early part to the mid part of the 19th century, towards the end of the 19th century, the conservation movement was founded and, in fact, the field of forestry as a field, uh, scientific endeavor took place right around 1900. In the 19th and 20th centuries then, as forestry started to be taught in universities and practice on the ground, we basically adopted what we might term an agricultural model. And that, it, that is that the idea was focused on the utility of the forest to produce a whole set of outputs. Timber, water were two dominant ones early on, later recreation, wildlife, habitat, etc. Grazing was another important output. So this view persisted pretty much uh, from the late 19th and throughout the 20th century. Forest productivity, enhancing forest productivity, was the dominant theme throughout this time period and correlates very well with this idea of an agricultural model. Geographically, we practiced forestry and taught forestry at the stand level. The stand is essentially a unit that's covered with vegetation that reacts pretty much uniformly to some treatment. The problem that we did not address was what happens to the adjacent stand when you treat one other stand. These stands were typically treated as isolated independent units. Timber was the dominant resource in the 19th and 20th centuries that we looked at from our forest. There were other outputs, as I already mentioned, and the practice of sustained yield was well ingrained. The idea was to manage all of these resources uh, in a sustainable fashion. And multiple uses were uh, recognized, and some became more important as time went on than others, and the notion of carrying capacity of the land was well ingrained. In the 21st century, we've moved away from the agricultural model to a great extent, certainly on many of our public lands in the United States and here in Washington. And this model is much more of an ecocentric approach or a biocentric approach, looking after the health of the resource uh, as one of the dominant themes. Rather than being output oriented, this is more of a state oriented view of a forest. How do we manage the forest towards some desirable future condition? We will receive outputs from the forest. This is not uh, completely devoid of an output, but we take outputs as we move the forest from one state towards that desired future state. Instead of forest productivity, I think we now are focusing more in the 21st century on maintaining the resiliency of the forest. Certainly in the face of potential climate change, we want to make sure we retain forest. As population grows and social pressure, pressures build, we also want to make sure our forest is resilient to these new pressures. The geographic level has changed from a stand to a landscape, so now we look at the effects of one stand treatment upon an adjacent stand. And then, rather than concentrate on timber, we've moved to more of a multi-resource uh, view of the world and of the forest, and sustainability has kind of uh, uh, outpaced the, the concept of sustained yield. And instead of multiple use, we speak of integrated use. This is a different way of thinking about forestry. It affects education of foresters as well as the practice of forestry. Why has this happened? There are many reasons. I'm just going to touch on a couple. Basically, society views forests different today than they did in the 19th century. We have a growing society, a growing population. It's much more affluent. 
and it's heavily urbanized. I, I think you all know that 80% of Americans live in cities as of the 2000 census, and 58% of Americans live in cities of 200,000 or more. These are the people that influence the policies that affect forests more than us that live in a more rural setting. There's a growing awareness of the ecological and the environmental implications of climate change, how that will affect our forest ecosystems over the next 50 to 100 years, and also the effects of globalization of trade and business of impacted forestry. A simple example of that is bringing in uh, invasive uh, insects into our, uh, into our country uh, as a result of trade. In addition, there's a recognition that we live on a human-dominated planet where both natural and man-caused disturbances play significant roles in ecosystem health and in maintaining the resiliency of our forest. There's also a growing concern over the loss of biodiversity in our managed forest, brought about by fragmentation and parcelization of the forest as development takes place in a helter-skelter fashion in many areas, the effects of, I've already mentioned, of invasive species and of endangered species, and then the list goes on wildfire. We want to continue to protect our water sources, providing ample recreation opportunities, and also addressing forest health. There's a lot of concern over all of these issues, and that's all had an impact on the change from one paradigm to another. You take all of these combined, these influences had, have had a very significant impact on the way we view our forest as a society and, how, and what we expect them to be uh, used for and how they should be treated uh, into the future. This creates a lot of new opportunities for us in the forest and natural resources arena. Our college has kept pace with these changes. Our mission statement has been revised. It now reads that we're interested in studying and investigating the functionality, that is how these ecosystems work, as well as the sustainability of these natural resource systems. We look at both natural and managed environments that stretch from the cities with our urban forest through the suburban out into the wildlands, and we approach all of this with an interdisciplinary set of tools that reach across different spatial scales as well as temporal scales. Yes, sustainability is the core factor of our college's mission. It's the common goal, it, it, and it influences everything we do. As we seek this dynamic equilibrium that balances the ecological functions and conditions with our social and economic factors, reaching across today's citizens as well as the generations that will come after us. What are some of the forces, then, that are impacting future change? Many of these are very common. We've already talked a little bit about the growing and affluent population. With more leisure time and, until recently, more disposable income, <laughs> global climate change is a tremendous uh, threat or opportunity. We have to be aware of what it might do to our forest ecosystems. I mentioned global trade with the impact of invasive species coming into our borders. Another force is the use of our of our forest for renewable energy, whether it's for bioenergy or biofuels, using some of the excess woody biomass that we now have, especially here in our state. Forest health continues to be a problem. We have not addressed it significantly in the last 10 years. We need to spend more of our resources bringing our forest back into a healthier condition and restoring ecosystems that have been degraded. And lastly, another force is the desire again, by society, to uh, restore our forest and to enhance biodiversity across the landscape. One little slide that looks at population growth for the state of Washington from 1880 out here to the year uh, 2000, we had about 6 million people, and that's about 88 people per square mile. Over the next 30 years, the Office of Financial Management expects that we'll add another 2.5 million people and that'll bring the density up to about 130 or so people per square mile. That's just one example. You could do this at different scales at the world level or at the whole U.S. level, but just the number of people crammed into a, a, a fixed land area is causing huge problems uh, for us as we manage these resources and all of the services they expect to come from these forest areas. An overview of Washington's forest. A little under half of our forest, 
is owned and managed by public entities and 56% by private. That's unusual for a western state. Usually it's heavily public, much more than 44%, but our state is different in that regard. That's scattered across western Washington and eastern Washington. About 60% in western Washington are more productive moist forest and about 40% in our drier, less productive eastern forest. In total, a little over 16 million acres of unreserved, that is not in wilderness or parks and so forth, commercial timberland. And a total, if you add in the non-commercial timberland, about 22 million acres, which is about half of the land area of our state. So we are a heavily forested state, and forests are very important to our culture and our quality of life. If we look at who owns the timber, it's a little opposite. Public has a little more of the standing inventory than the privates do, 53 versus 47 percent. A couple of little statistics, and sometimes these boggle the mind, but currently in the, I say currently around 2000, 2002 are the latest numbers, about 60 billion cubic feet of standing inventory was found on these uh, 16 million acres here in Washington. That equates out in board feet to about 250 billion. Uh, I'll use the uh, cubic foot here the rest of this slide. These are trees that are five inches and larger than are live. Just for comparison, I put a, a statistic up there that in 2005, the whole country consumed about 21 billion cubic feet. Uh, about 17 of that was actually produced in America and the other 4 billion cubic feet was imported. It gives you some idea of the magnitude of the size of our inventory. In terms of growing, it's growing at about 1.5 billion cubic feet per year, which is around 6 billion board feet on a rough conversion. And according to the U.S. Forest Service statistics that I'm citing, we were removing a little less than that, 1.4 billion. Those removals were not only harvest, but they were losses due to fire and land clearing as well. So our, our resource is still accumulating inventory over time. The last harvest statistics I could find was 2003. This is an odd statistic, but it's a reality that most of our harvest now, 81%, is coming from the private lands in our state even though they still have almost half of the inventory and the public lands are contributing only 19 percent. The Washington State DNR cuts 84 percent of that 19 percent uh, or 16 percent of the total and that leaves the U.S. Forest Service and other publics with 3 percent. On the private side, I've included all private owners in that 81 percent. Private owners that own conversion facilities as well as the timber investment management organizations, the real estate investment trust, the master limited partnerships who don't, as well as the Native American, some own conversion and some don't. It's quite an imbalance. I don't know that this is sustainable going out over time to have that great imbalance. I think the public forests are where tremendous opportunities still lie. Now, what are some of the issues we need to pay attention to going forward? One is kind of a social thing. I think we need to continue to build collaborative institutional arrangements and organizational networks. That means we have to learn to work much better with each other. In the old days, we had the industry and we had the government. Now we have a tremendous set of volunteer organizations, foundations, NGOs that are heavily involved in conservation and we all have to somehow try to get on the same page and work together uh, to retain and build our, our forest. Another paradigm that I think we have to recognize much more explicitly is that we have to build risk and uncertainty directly into our decision making because we have all seen the uncertainty on the financial side that affects how we manage our resources and we certainly have it on the biological side with something like climate change. I think we also have to recognize that we can forget about looking for a steady state and saying I'm going to wait a little while before things settle down because my guess is they're not going to settle down, that we're in an environment of constant change socially as well as biologically and I think we just have to recognize that and, and adopt different strategies. We're going to hear a lot today about our conversion of our forest into non-forest uses. This is primarily on our private lands 
This has tremendous consequences. It leads to excessive fragmentation of our landscape that many of you have already heard of. And this leads to undesirable consequences from the forest point of view, as well as from the forest manager's point of view. We're losing our infrastructure to process wood products in our state. Uh, if we're going to have active stewardship of our real estate, we have to have a processing capability or those woods will not be removed from our forest. We also have to recognize that we're not just sitting out here as an island in Washington. There's tremendous domestic competition for our wood products. The southern U.S. is a tremendous competitor. We have foreign competition from our friends to the north, as well as other countries further offshore. We are losing market share to these other uh, uh, entities. Forest health. We have overly dense forest, both in western Washington and eastern Washington. That leads to reduced tree vigor, just like when you go out and weed your garden, you want to have those plants that remain grow faster. We're having the same problem in our forest. Once those trees lose vigor, they become more prone to disease and insect attack, increased fire risk, and loss of biodiversity. Biomass conversion, I've mentioned earlier, for either energy or transportation fuels offers a tremendously new market that we need to really start to work even harder than we have so far. We have to come with a workable solution to pay landowners for ecosystem services that they provide free, such as carbon storage, biodiversity enhancements, water production, wildlife habitat, erosion control. We have to try to direct development, stay out of our more pristine areas in our state of our forest, direct that development into either rural villages or urban areas by using either purchase or transfer of development rights. And I think we need to re-examine our tax policies and our regulations to reduce disincentives for maintaining our working forest in healthy conditions. In summary, I think we've entered a new era that will require new thinking and new models for forest stewardship. The future will be very different from the past but we have many exciting opportunities and challenges if we have the public policies that will support these new opportunities. We also need a highly educated professional workforce to deal with the complexities and the trade-offs measured across the three metrics of sustainability. The future is bright. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Ivan Easton. Ivan is the Professor of Forest Products Marketing and the Director of the Center for International Trade in Forest Products at the college. His research includes evaluating factors influencing the adoption of new wood products, marketing of lesser known uh, tropical hardwoods and non-timber forest products, substitution issues between wood and non-wood materials, influences on competitiveness of U.S. forest products in Asia, and the impacts of illegal logging on deforestation and trade. Ivan lived in West Africa for four years, first as a Peace Corps volunteer and a faculty member at the University of Liberia, and later as a Fulbright scholar in Ghana. Thank you, I'd like to thank everybody for being here today and for taking the time to participate in this series. Uh, what I'd like to do with this presentation is to kind of provide the broad view to begin with, narrow into the forest products industry in Washington State, and, and put that within a national context. But, but looking at how the national economy is going, if I stop there, I'll probably plunge the audience into the depths of despair. So what I'd like to do is, is step back again and place the, the industry in Washington into an international context where we see a lot of opportunities. So the, the title of my presentation is, is Markets Happen, and we just need to respond to those. So what I'll do is I'll, first of all, take a look at the U.S. market and provide a summary of that and an outlook, and then focus in on the forest products industry in Washington and see what, how that's responding to the domestic market. And then we'll step back and take a look at, at trade and international opportunities, and then I'll conclude with a few strategic op uh, observations. So first, let's take a look at the housing crisis and how that's impacting the forest products industry within the U.S. Housing starts in the U.S. have plunged between 2005 and, and 2008 by about 56 percent, and they're expected to drop another 49 percent uh, in 2009, which would bring housing starts below the 500,000 level for the first time since World War II. 
How the recovery is going to be slow after that. We're going to see housing starts start to recover in 2010 and 11, but we really won't get back to, to housing start levels that we're used to until around 2013. So we're going to have this period of transition as the market starts to recover. And if we focus only on the domestic market, then I think that the, the industry is in for a lot of trouble. But, but happily, there's, there's some tremendous opportunities in international markets uh, in the meantime. Lumber consumption uh, in the U.S. Uh, was down by about 31 percent between 2005 and 2008. And lumber production was down by a little bit less, by about 24 percent. So the biggest hit was with softwood lumber imports coming in from Canada primarily. Uh, when we saw the, the loss of almost all imports out of Europe. Now, where is softwood lumber consumed? Well, the primary market has always been within the uh, residential construction sector, particularly new homes. And you can see that that's plunged by about 57 percent between 2005 and 2008. And now the dominant use of softwood lumber in the U.S. is in the repair and remodel market. That came down by, uh, by a relatively modest 18 percent. The other two major markets, commercial construction, and material handling actually grew from 2005 and 2008, and we expect a slight decline in 2009, but there's some real market opportunities there. Softwood lumber production, primarily uh, what we've seen in the past is that the U.S. West dominated softwood lumber production in the U.S. Uh, up until the late 1980s with the removal of the federal timber from the supply basket. Uh, we went through a period of transition here in the Northwest, consolidation and restructuring of the industry, by the, by the late uh, 1990s, the industry started to rebound, and then, of course, we ran into the housing crisis, and we saw housing um, fall. Softwood lumber production in the West fell, and for the first time in our history, softwood lumber production in the West fell below softwood lumber production in the South. So between 2005 and 2008, softwood lumber production in the West fell by about 30 percent, and in the South by about 20 percent. So as this industry starts to recover, the big question is, what will happen with our softwood lumber production industry here in the, in the Northwest? So now I'd like to focus in a little bit on Washington and talk about the role of the forest sector in the Washington in the economy. And, and it's quite a great role. It, we provide uh, the gross business income generated by the forest sector is about 3% of total gross business income for the state. And we generate around 45,000 jobs uh, in the forest sector across Washington. And perhaps more importantly, those forestry jobs represent about 18 percent of total manufacturing jobs in the state of Washington. So this sector has a tremendous uh, impact on the economy of the state. And more importantly, if we take a look at where a lot of those jobs are, they're in rural timber dependent communities. And so this sector really provides an economic underpinning to some of those rural locations. Looking over time, we can see that, that while employment in the forest sector has come down a little bit, it's still up about 45 to 47,000. And perhaps more importantly is, is the wages that those jobs pay, on average around $47,000. So these are, these are manufacturing jobs in rural timber-dependent communities that provide living wages for families living there. And oftentimes those jobs can't be substituted for. The loss of those jobs in those communities means that there aren't other opportunities. So the loss of the timber supply from the National Forest really had an impact on the structure of the industry, the, the, the sawmill industry in particular in the Northwest and in Washington State. And what we saw was a lot of these small sawmills that were located in rural timber dependent communities that were heavily reliant on that federal timber went out of business. And as that industry restructured, it started to move in towards the I-5 corridor around our transportation centers. And so we saw this migration of the processing infrastructure from the rural areas into the, the more suburban areas, but the timber harvest is still out there. So we see 65%, about two-thirds of our timber is still harvested out in those rural areas, but it's moved into the suburban areas, uh, particularly in the Puget Sound corridor, where it's processed into wood products. And more importantly, the loss of the wood processing infrastructure on the, on the East Cascades, where we have some serious forest, forest health issues, undermines the ability of forest managers uh, to manage the forest, to improve forest health and to restore forest vitality there. That's emphasized in this map right here. You can see the small dots on this map, the red ones, those are where sawmills were located in 2006, the most recent data that I have. This big orange oval that you see is along the East Cascades uh, timberlands. Most of that is national forest. And you see that between central Okanagan and central Yakima, there are no sawmills. So as the national forest starts moving towards improving forest health there, 
that, that whole process is undermined by the lack of processing infrastructure. If you're going to pull this dead and dying timber out of the forest, what are you going to do with it? And if you don't have a processing infrastructure, it undermines the whole economics of, of timber management and, and forest health operations. So I've painted kind of a bleak picture if we stay focused on the domestic market. So let's take a look at what's going on internationally. Uh, that things look a little bit better there. In fact, overall, exports from the U.S. were up 11 percent between 2006 and 2008. So as we see the domestic market declining, we see that there's some real opportunities internationally. One of the drivers of that growth in exports has been the, the, the weakening of the U.S. dollar. And even though it's strengthened a little bit recently, over the period 2002 to 2009, we've seen that the U.S. dollar has weakened 25 percent against the Japanese yen, one of our major customers, 23 percent against the Canadian dollar, and 33 percent against the euro, two of our major competitors in supplying these offshore markets. As a result, the trade deficit for wood products has, has really had a big change. We've gone from a trade deficit of about $28 billion to a trade deficit of about $16 billion, an improvement of about 45 percent. Looking at the United States as a wood products exporter, Washington is the single largest state contributing to exports from the, state of, from, from the United States. We generate almost 18 percent of total wood exports out of the country. So Washington's a big player in this sector. Of particular importance is the, the growing importance of value-added products in the export mix. Value-added products not only bring more back to the, to the raw material, but most of the companies that are involved in the production and export of value-added products are small and medium-sized enterprises who are traditionally the drivers of economic growth within the country and who generate the greatest proportion of jobs within the country. So what we want to try and do, particularly in a period of economic downturn, is to encourage those firms to get involved in the international markets where we can see that, that growth is, is uh, an opportunity and to bring more of those companies into uh, the export markets. Because the reliance on a single market leaves you exposed to economic downturns. And a classic example is what's happening in the U.S. right now. Internationally, markets tend to be countercyclical. So as one market is down, one economy is down, other economies tend to be in other phases of economic growth or decline. And as an exporter, you can take a look at those uh, opportunities and find opportunities where there's growth occurring as your domestic market is declining and, and change the portfolio of your export sale or of your sales to favor those export markets. As we move towards more value added wood products exporting though, what we find is small and medium sized firms don't often have those managerial and financial capabilities to go out and research those markets and identify where those new opportunities are. And that's where a group like Centerfor can come in to work with them to identify new markets, emerging markets, to match a, a small or medium sized company with a market opportunity that plays to their competitive advantages and help them develop strategies to get into those markets. So what I'd like to do now is talk about a couple of opportunities that, that are emerging on the horizon internationally that should provide even greater opportunities for wood exports out of the U.S. The first will be taking a look at uh, the Russian log export tax, which will be uh, fully implemented in January of next year. The second thing will be talking a little bit about public procurement policies uh, in some of the developed countries. So currently, the Russian log export tax is 25%. Uh, in January of next year, that will move up to 80%, at which time it will virtually eliminate Russian logs from the international market. You can see with a log export tax of just 25%, Russia's exports of, uh, export share has gone from 45% to 25%. And if that log export tax is fully implemented to 80%, we can expect to see Russia's market share drop maybe to 15 or 10%. That in itself will provide tremendous opportunities. So looking at uh, the two major markets that, that import Russian logs, the first one is China. Uh, between 2006 and 2008, their imports of Russian softwood logs dropped from 22 million cubic meters to 19 million cubic meters. And over the same period of time, we saw the U.S. market share increase by about 24 percent. Where are the opportunities? Um, we see that over the next several years, uh, imports from non-Russian sources could increase by as much as 4 million cubic meters per year, with lumber imports increasing by about 700 million or 700,000 cubic meters per year. Looking at Japan, 
Again, Russia is a major supplier of softwoods into the Japanese market. Most of those are used in the post and beam industry, building post and beam houses. Uh, those, those log exports into Japan dropped from 5 million cubic meters in 2006 to about 2 million cubic meters. And at the same time, U.S. market share of softwood logs into the Japanese market increased from 24 to 32 percent. So there's some opportunities in Japan. By the way, that picture there shows a log deck out in, in Hiroshima, outside of a sawmill. All of those logs there are Douglas fir being processed into um, Hirokaku and Hashira to be used uh, post and beams for the post and beam industry. The opportunities, we see that log imports from non-Russian sources could increase by as much as a million cubic meters per year and lumber imports increasing by up to 200,000 cubic meters per year. The second thing I want to talk about are public procurement policies. These are primarily directed at ensuring that wood imported into a country is from legally harvested wood. It's, it's not really focused so much on certification and sustainability, but really more on legality, ensuring legality. These public procurement policies have primarily been adopted by the EU, by Japan, and just recently uh, through the Lacey Act of uh, the United States. Um, major wood exporters have started to respond to these now. Uh, these are the major demand drivers for their wood products. And so countries like China, Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia are starting to get chain of, chain of custody certification to be able to demonstrate the legality of the wood that's being used in their products in order to maintain their access to these markets. And this is critical for them because the domestic market in these countries is not big enough to absorb the production. And so they rely on an export growth model. And so maintaining access to these export markets is critical to these countries. One way to do that is to get chain of custody certification, which ensures that all of your wood products through that process can be demonstrated to be legal. Also, as you move towards more chain of custody certification, you cre increase the demand for certified wood. And so we see some real opportunities for certified wood coming out of the US, where we have about 105 million acres of certified forest. That's about 20% of the wood in the US, um, or 20% of the forest land in the US. And certified wood, by definition, is legal. So as you're a, an international company in China or Indonesia looking at ensuring uh, and demonstrating legality of your, your source wood into your products, having certified wood in there uh, provides you with a real market opportunity and market advantage. And the growth of chain of custody certified companies has been astronomic. Uh, in 2004, we had less than 100 companies in the, in the four major export markets that had chain of custody certification. Today, in just these markets alone, there's well over 1,000. And some of these, com some of these companies are huge and, and import huge volumes of wood. So there's tremendous opportunities in that sector. So I'd like to end up with just a couple of strategic observations. First, we know within the domestic market, the demand is going to be down uh, through the next few years. Uh, and so it's imperative that forest products companies start to look more and more towards export markets to kind of tide them over until the, market, the domestic market turns around. And the weak dollar is certainly going to help them to do that. Also, ex developing these export markets helps them to, to reduce their risk and exposure to loss in one market. And the key here is that when they make that decision to go international, they need to do it for the long term. Because custom, foreign customers are very sensitive to the fact that they want their suppliers to be long term and they have a long term commitment to their market. So one thing that these companies are going to need to be thinking about is, can we make that long term commitment to the international market? Because that's going to be required. Um, and then two things that are going to help these companies uh, in the international markets are the public procurement policies. That, that require that would be shown to be legal, and the Russian log export tax that's going to reduce the supply of Russian logs onto the market, assuming that this Russian log export tax is implemented. It was supposed to be implemented in uh, January of this year. It was postponed to January of next year because of the, the dire economic conditions globally. So we'll see if it is implemented next year. There's also been a challenge or a threat of a challenge in front of WTO, and the Russians are sensitive to this as well. Finally, wood manufacturing is an important component of Washington's economy. It generates about 3.2% of our, our uh, gross business uh, revenue here in the state and provides about 18% of the manufacturing jobs, many of which are in rural timber-dependent communities. 
And then the loss of this wood processing infrastructure along the East Cascades undermines our ability uh, to manage forests, to improve forest health, and to restore forest vitality. And that is just as critical as the economic contribution of the forest industry in the state. So with that, I'll conclude, and thank you very much for your attention. Jerry Franklin is professor of ecosystem science. Jerry's BS and MS degrees in forestry are from Oregon State University and his PhD in botany from Washington State University. The first 35 years of Jerry's career was with the Pacific Northwest Experiment Station, a research station, where he was involved in the International Biology, Bi Biology Program and led the research team at the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest in Oregon. Since coming to UW in 1986, he's been involved in research on structure and function of forest ecosystems and landscape ecology and ecological forestry. Jerry also often provides policy advice to federal and state government organizations. Jerry? Basically, I'm going to talk very broadly about uh, ecosystem services and the various kinds of environmental concerns. And as you'll see, they overlap a lot with uh, what uh, we've already heard and what we're going to be hearing. Uh, first of all, I'll just make the point that's pretty obvious to all of us. Uh, our region is defined by the forest. It's, it's really fundamental uh, to the entire, well, gestalt of this region. Uh, and, you know, we're known for our forests, we're known for our, our wet, productive environment. Uh, and, of course, I include with that the streams that are a part of those systems. It's been traditional in forestry to ignore the aquatic elements of our systems, but I think we've reached a point where we understand that, in fact, uh, the forests and the streams which they contain are integral. Uh, and, of course, uh, some of the denizens of those aquatic systems are also very much uh, uh, an element of our culture, uh, of our history, of our environment. So I'm just going to go through uh, a series of points. Uh, first of all, you know, the obvious one, a tremendous variety of services uh, of various kinds, goods and services. Uh, and I've listed some of these here. And I might note that all of these are social values. They may be social ecological, they may be social economic, they may be social cultural, but all of the values that we value for us for are in fact socially defined. I want to just emphasize a couple. I think probably the interaction of the forest with the hydrologic cycle is probably the most important issue in the 21st century. And I think uh, that most of us understand that, in fact, uh, it is water that is probably the most important single good that we depend upon our forested landscapes for. And we're very interested in having uh, a very high quality flow of water and one uh, which is uh, well regulated, so we don't want water in this form. Rather, we want high quality water uh, provided in a highly regulated kind of fashion. So that's, in my view, the most important uh, product uh, for our forested watersheds in this century and the one that we will probably be giving the most attention to uh, as we are influenced by climate change. Another one, of course, uh, that we're very interested in, we're going to hear a lot about, is carbon. Uh, and one of the things uh, that we've learned about our forests in the Northwest is that they are extraordinary in their ability to sequester carbon. In fact, there is no ecosystem in the world, including the tropical rainforest, that can match uh, the capacity of our forest uh, to store carbon. Uh, and one of the things that we have done in our 200 years of uh, western settlement of this region is to draw down the carbon reserves of these uh, natural forests, probably about 80 percent from what the historic levels of carbon storage were in our forest landscapes. So there is a tremendous uh, 
capacity there to sequester a large amount of additional carbon. Probably, if you look around the world uh, at all the natural systems, uh, there is none that matches our ability uh, to sequester carbon over the next 50 years, just depending upon what kind of policy we have. And one of the most prominent ways to do that would be to lengthen the rotations uh, on our managed forest lands. Obviously, we're also very interested in biodiversity, and we're going to hear about that. Uh, we certainly are interested in wildlife, but we've become very interested in non-game species for one reason or another. And you can argue uh, whether or not we've made the right decision as a society, but we care about things like spotted owls, and we care a lot about food webs uh, that support various kinds of organisms, and here's part of the food web of the northern spotted owl. Something else we're becoming concerned about for the first time is early successional communities, the early successional communities on forested sites. And I don't mean clear cuts. I mean primarily structurally complex early successional communities. And it turns out a great many of the animals that we're interested in, you either uh, specialists for that kind of habitat or thrive in that kind of habitat. Uh, one of the things that all of this uh, array of, of, of values um, leads us toward, and a lesson that I think we've learned, I hope we've learned, is that particularly with regards to the public lands, and that's very broadly interpreted, it certainly would include the DNR trust lands, uh, we've learned that we really can't go lurching from one kind of emphasis to another. It turns out every time that we have decided we're going to maximize some kind of an output, we end up marginalizing other important values. And we've simply got uh, to stop doing that kind of thing. And I think, you know, it's a lesson that most of us have learned, but there are always risks. Uh, that we're going to fall back into that kind of attitude. And when I hear about the, the fire people and the fuel people talking about fuel treatments instead of ecosystem restoration in the east side forest, it troubles me greatly. Uh, and it should be clear, I think, to all resource managers by this point, that we depend upon the forest, we look to the forest for so many values that uh, any kind of program that uh, effectively marginalizes uh, a bunch of those values isn't going to be uh, socially acceptable. Second point is, obviously, and we've heard about it already and we'll hear it more, we need to retain our forest lands in order to provide for those benefits. And that's not as easy as it would seem. And certainly globalization is a part of the reason why that's a very difficult issue for us to deal with. Because it turns out uh, that the fiber farms of the southern hemispheres are fierce competitors and are extremely productive in terms of being able to produce wood fiber. And uh, it's, uh, when you couple that with the labor costs that are less, uh, these uh, are going to, in effect, provide most of the common wood fiber, either in solid form or in remanufactured form, for global trade in common uh, forest products. And as already has been suggested, uh, you know, uh, if we're going to want uh, to have some global markets, we're going to have to be more specialized about it. We're not going to be able to go mana a mana on uh, these kinds of fiber farms uh, in our forest lands. I just want to point out to you the corporate forest lands are gone. Now, I know there are people here that will argue with me on the point. The point is that the corporate timberlands, which were the most productive of our forest lands, are now effectively dedicated to maximizing return on investment highest and best use, in quotes. And that does not imply any continued commitment to forest stewardship or forest production. It just is the way that REITs 
and Timo's work. And so, again, we're going to be having to think about specialized kinds of markets, specialized kinds of products. Third thing, and this begins to get into the real concerns, uh, we really have a challenge, and that is to restore our forest landscapes uh, and to prepare them for climate change. And I sort of take the, 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 the triplet here of to restore, restore the ecosystems to greater functionality and sustainability, prepare them for climate change as best as we can, and monitor their vital signs. Obviously, uh, one of the things we're very interested in, particularly on the federal lands, but a lot of the trust lands, we're trying to do the same sort of thing. We've discovered that some of those forests that we thought we were going to manage for timber production, for wood fiber, were not. And we're very interested in trying to move them along in terms of creating more structural complexity, more biodiversity. Obviously, uh, on the East side, I prefer to refer to it as the dry forest because there are a lot of stand replacement kinds of forests on the east side as well. But the dry forest, uh, as a result of our management and mismanagement of that resource over the last 150 years, we have forests uh, that were once very resilient to fire that are now very vulnerable to fire. Uh, and uh, we end up uh, with these kinds of situations following uh, those kinds of events which were not particularly characteristic of those landscapes. We have an immense job ahead of us to try to restore those forests uh, to a, a sustainable condition, one that is going to have a better opportunity to persist in the face of climate change. And I don't suggest that we want to go back to this kind of historic condition, which incidentally is a current condition in this particular stand, but rather that uh, we will want to move in something like that direction. So we have a lot to restore. We also have a lot to prepare, uh, because as you're going to hear, climate change uh, is going to come, and it's not going to come gently, although some of it will come gently. For the most part, it's going to come with a bang and a crash uh, and bust in the front door. And a number of us predicted uh, in a paper back in 1991 that we would experience climate change most profoundly in a result uh, of changes in uh, intense disturbances. And I'd originally thought that was going to be primarily fire, but it's turning out to be uh, actually as much or more in the way of insect outbreaks. Uh, and we've got some immense ones underway. This is, of course, the biggest. This is the uh, mountain pine beetle outbreak. Uh, we also see, in fact, changes in our established old forests paper published recently in Science that shows uh, that we actually see a accelerating rate of mortality in those forests, very subtle kind of change. Now, all of these things suggest to me that we need to be doing a lot more monitoring uh, of vital signs than we have been doing. And I think, you know, this is, of course, the crane at Wind River, but I'm using it to make a point. Can you believe that there is only one forest stand in the state, in fact, in the Northwest, in fact, on the Pacific Coast, where we actually monitor carbon flux between a forest and the atmosphere. Only one place where we actually measure net primary productivity in a forest, because you don't measure net primary productivity by going out and hugging trees with a diameter tape. And we do it. We do it with a very sophisticated set of measurements, uh, basically, that allow us to measure that, that flux between forest and atmosphere on a continuing basis. We're in our 13th year of making that measurement. But if there was ever a vital sign of an ecosystem, that is it. And incredibly, we don't do it. I wanted to just acknowledge that we're allowed to do it because some foundations stood up and gave us the resources to do it with.
primary challenge, uh, really, I think we're going to see with climate change is maintaining ecosystem functionality. I think we're going to find ourselves a whole lot less worried about biodiversity and products and just trying to keep the place together. Okay, I think that's what we're going to be looking at. And when you have this kind of a disturbance and you essentially have no replacement species, uh, you could end up with some very, very unpleasant conditions in landscapes. So I think we're going to be looking a lot at functionality. Yeah, and don't forget, we have allowed our resource management agencies to undergo an incredible decline. The Forest Service most profoundly of all. Ever since the Forest Service quit cutting 4.8 billion board feet a year in this region, the support for that agency has declined and declined and declined. And you cannot deal with restoration, you cannot deal with climate change without a vibrant resource management agency that has a critical mass of people and adequate funding. It's absolutely imperative that we as a society support our resource management agencies. It's just tragic, and it's something we have to correct or our resources are not going to be taken care of. So I want to conclude my concluding points here. Forests provide many critical goods and services. You know that. We need to maintain our forest base. We're going to have to have a lot of incentives out there to allow us to do that. We need to manage for multiple, not singular objectives. Let's stop talking about singular kinds of goals and let's start talking about managing ecosystems and restoring ecosystems. We have an immense challenge, particularly on our public lands, to restore, to prepare them for climate change, and to monitor them so that we have some idea of what's actually happening out there. We need to know. We need to be monitoring vital signs, and we are not. We are not. Finally, we need to restore the resource agencies. So thank you.